What exactly was it that you revealed in your investigative journalism? We were able to unpack a, a scheme whereby a president was was effectively kept by by a group of of businessmen. Mm. They they were able to capture the state by controlling the president and control how the state spent its money and a lot of that was channeled into their pockets. How many years did you spend investigating these issues together? My team at Amabungani started investigating uh, our president, our former president Jacob Zuma and his, his friends the Guptas back in, in 2010. So it's been about eight years of investigation. How did the public react, your readers, in the beginning? In the beginning, the, you know, the, the, the question from a lot of people, including even from, from some of our editors, was, you know, who is this Indian family that you keep writing about and why is it important? Why, why, why are you hammering us with this? Um, and some of the early stories became complicated quite quickly. It was financial, complicated um, evidence of corruption. And it was not necessarily, you know, we didn't necessarily have the smoking gun, but we could see enough to say that something was, was, was going wrong. But it was just a bit too abstract, I think, for, for a lot of people to understand. Um, How did you explain complex and complicated financial information to the public? It's, it's, it's very difficult to, to explain complicated and complex financial information to, to readers. It, it's firstly hard for us to understand it ourselves. We're not, you know, I, I was trained in botany, not finance or, or economics, but here I am, a journalist, investigating this sort of thing. The first thing that we have to do is to, to understand it ourselves. Um, and when we understand it ourselves very well, then we can under, understand what we're trying to explain to our readers. And then, if we can write well and if we're well practiced at it, then we can do, do, do a good job of that. I think in the beginning we, we did not explain these things very well. Our stories were often too dense. Um, at the time we were, we were writing only for a newspaper, as opposed to now where we do a lot online. So we were very constrained with, with word lengths. And we would try to pack a lot of forensic detail, a lot of dry detail into, into a very small space. And it didn't always work very well. It, it maybe tabled the facts. Um, it's, it got, got a first draft of history down, but people didn't necessarily get it. And um, we've gotten better in, in recent years. What tools did you use as a journalist in order to convey complex stories? What changed? Um, to convey the compli complicated stories, we, we chose to focus a lot, a lot more on our writing. We've been coaching ourselves a lot, a lot more in how to write. And it, it comes down to some, some very basic writing, writing rules. Um, keep it simple. Um, go, for, go for straightforward language whenever you can, rather than, rather than the legal or financial jargon. And that can be difficult, um, because the jargon is sometimes there to, to, to explain very specific things. But now we have to explain specific things accurately and fairly, but in, but in, in simple, straightforward language. In any event, that's, that's, that's the job of journalists. That's, that's, that's why we're there. So we, we have to rise to that challenge. Um, and I have found one of, the, one of the helpful writing tools has been to, well, they, they taught me this in, in, in journalism school. You know, one of the first things is to focus on the, the, the human aspects, but that, that, that's real. We, we used to focus a lot on, on telling dry stories of contracts and, and bank records and invoices. We now try and, well, I try and write my stories around, around the people, around the characters, um, not too many of them. Try not to, be, not, try not to unfairly dramatize them, but to, to tell the story through their words and through their actions and through um, vignettes of, of where they live and what, what they look like. Sometimes, sometimes I'll lay down all the, the, the good quotes that I've got and then, then I'll pull out the good quotes or, or vignettes that, that actually point towards what it is that I'm trying to say. And then I'll structure my story around that. Um, another, an, another tool that we use 
Well, it's, a, it's, it's an obvious tool in, in news journalism, but we, we try to remember that we're news journalists first before being, being long narrative storytellers, and, and we try and get to the point quite quickly at the top of the article. Maybe it's in an introduction, or maybe it's a little bit down off, after some, some, some color, but we'll try and say in plain, simple language what it is this article is about. Um, if I can keep talking, I've got quite a lot to say on this, but um, it, it's the same question that I ask myself when I'm thinking about how to draft my story. It is, this article will show you that or how X, Y, Z. And that, that basic idea, this article is about this. This article will show you that. Um, I, I try and write, write that in very, very much near the top of my story, whether it's a colorful introduction or a hard-nosed hard introduction so that people know what it's about. Um, and then, then I try and find a railroad. That's something I learned from, from a very, very good write, writing coach, but a, but a railroad for my story so that the readers know you know, this is the path that the story story is going from, going along. There are different different kinds of railroads you can choose, but the most obvious one is is uh, is a chronological sequence. So, maybe I might say th at the top of the story, this story is about X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, and then I say it all started when, and it starts the story at the beginning, and you you write out what happened, um, preferably focusing on the people, and I find that is the easiest way to tell a complicated story. Let the story tell itself. You have said that some of the first stories that came out were like lead balloons. Today, they're more like party balloons. <laughs> What's happened? M many of the stories that we write, you know, we, 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 we're exercising our, our news judgment. We're seeking, we're seeking us to, to tell stories that are in the public interest, that, mm. that bring powerful people and powerful organizations and powerful structures to account. So we're seeking to do accountability journalism. And we, we make our decisions about what we write and how we write them and when we write them um, based on that. And it doesn't always line up with the news agenda. So we'll often find ourselves going down a rabbit hole about, say, a group of businessmen who become curiously close to, to our new president. And we'll start writing complicated stories about them because we, we are convinced on our judgment of the facts that, that this is important for, for our country, for South Africa. But it's not necessarily obvious at, at the time, and people ignore the story. So that's why I say they often go down like a lead balloon. Um, as we can now say in South Africa, after about a decade of doing this, they are now party balloons. Um, the, the, the stories ultimately gained meaning over the years as our news judgment was proved to be correct, um, as, as, you know, as, as events proved and as further investigation and research proved that what we thought was happening was really happening, and its impact on the country was real. And, and now people, people take note to, to the point where we are now able to write. I think by global standards, extremely complicated forensic financial stories, and that well, which get lapped up by the South African readers because they now know that that is, that is where the story is hidden. The story is hidden in, in, the, financial, in, in the complicated financial details. Would you say that your readers has changed over the years? Their capacity has changed? Yes, so over, over the years, our, our readers' capacity has definitely changed. Um, uh, they, they're, they're reading longer, more complicated stories. The type of readers also apparently changed, although we don't necessarily have very, very good metrics on that. But it does, it does seem, seem that way. We're now taken more seriously by people in power, by decision makers, by regulators. Our stories are trickling down into the poorer parts of the country, it seems, um, because the, the essential meaning of them, mm. whilst previously it was hard to grasp, now with our, our economy on the rocks and with our state-owned enterprises in deep in debt and threatening to, to bring down parts of our country and with many people across economic levels unable to do business, say, with the state because they can't com compete with the rent seekers who, who have managed to capture the government. You know, all of the, those people suddenly become our readers because they, they, they're, they're finding the, the, the story of their lives in, in our investigations. How do you see the role that investigative reporting has had in what we see now when Suma has resigned? So just last night at, at I think it was ten o'clock, uh, 
former president Jacob Zuma announced that he was he was going to resign, and as we're speaking now, uh, our, our parliament has is is voting in a new president, and that that change very much has is is very much rooted in a lot of the investigation that 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 we've been doing, and um, the, the stories that 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 we've told have made it. You know, it's, it's produced evidence that, that, that the leadership and the voters, more importantly, could, could not ignore, whereas they, they used to ignore them. But I'm also wary to, to overstate that. Um, uh, the investigative journalism has had a, had a huge impact on, on where South Africa is today, but there, there's, there's other more important things at play. You know, they're, they're, they're the people who, who wrote our constitution and who designed our, our democracy to, to bring us out of apartheid. Um, and who who put together our structures of state, which our former president Zuma has destroyed many of those, or damaged at least many of those, but many others still stand. And the civil society and the the, the sort of deep um, protesting or dissident ethos of, of of South Africans in civil society remains. And that's you know th those are the people and those those are the structures that that seem to have allowed us to report mm. without fear or favor and for change to happen democratically. Uh, I think it's probably fair to, to say that, that former President Jacob Zuma would have stuck on beyond, beyond his constitutional term as president if, if he could have. Um, he certainly tried to delay his power as long as possible, but, but he's out now constitutionally. I mean, he's out and you know, there's been no serious violence around that. It's, it's happening democratically. So it's much more than just investigative journalism. We, we, we're existing within, within a country and with a people, within a nation that supports us. Where do you see investigative journalism in South Africa going now? Which direction is it important to move in? Um, Feels like we've gotten to the, to the top of a curve as investigative reporters in South Africa, and now we're we're in that stalling phase where where we go, how how we take flight from here is is remains to be seen. Um, a lot of us have been very ingrained in, in, in reporting on on corruption in the Zuma era, and there's a cast of characters and a cast of well um, types and methods and modus operandi of of corruption and state capture and mismanagement that we've become used to reporting on. But now there's a, there's a new sheriff in town and he comes with his own problems. Not only that, there's a, a ruling party that allowed Zuma to happen that is still the ruling party and might well be for many years to come. Um, we have a whole new field of, of strong opposition parties that are jockeying in different ways that need to be interrogated. And then we have other kinds of questions that we that we need to be exploring that aren't just about about corruption. It's about you know how how one of our biggest cities has has found itself in a in a in a devastating drought. Um, how did this happen? Why did this happen? How can it be fixed? Or um, what's going to happen with it with our, our national power utility, which is which is deep in debt and is currently appears to be surviving on a month-to-month -month basis using, using bridge financing, in which you know, it's a situation that has the cap capacity to, to destroy our economy and jobs and land where, where white, white people stole land from, from, from anyone with a dark skin in South Africa many years ago. And many of those who still, still own land are, are white. Now, I, I think it's a, a debatable question of value um, how, how, how worthy that land is. However, politically and socially, there are many people who, who, who would shut me down and, and for, for some very, very good reasons about that. It's, it's, a, it's a serious question. But I, I don't know where we're going to go as investigative journalists now in South Africa, but um, we, we, we must start thinking fast and start understanding the new direction. Have you experienced any uh, reprisals? There've been there've been many rep reprisals for our kind of reporting and for specifically for our reporting in South Africa and not just myself and my media colleagues but but other journalists too and also also whistleblowers. Um, 
Personally, I'm being sued for defamation by our tax commissioner and by the, the tax collection service itself. Um, it's, I don't believe, a, a winnable case that, they, that they've got. I believe it's just, just intimidation. Um, another journalist has just published a book in South Africa and he's being sued on, on more or less the same grounds, also for defamation. But in both cases, the, the tax, com tax commissioner is trying to make the argument that we, we criminally broke the, the tax act. Um, some of my colleagues face criminal charges for, for their reporting on former President Jacob Zuma's spokesperson. Um, that seems to have been, been chased away now because that case was also rubbish. Um, but it goes further than that. Uh, and, you know, when, when things became really tough for Jacob Zuma and, and the people who were supporting him, they mobilized a, a sort of faux grassroots campaign to target by name um, leading journalists. And that became a little bit violent at, at times. Uh, but not seriously violent. No, no, no one was killed. But but there were there were rumbles and there were there were there were scuffles. But also what it did, what it might have done, or what it could have done was was establish a kind of new new normal, a new nar new narrative. It doesn't seem like South Africans have accepted it, but that 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 remains to be seen. Um, and there's there's deeper violence. There are journalists who've who've really been been badly attacked. There's a journalist uh, from from the state broadcaster who was attacked many times for standing up against government interference, and she ultimately died. Um, there were whistleblowers on one of the corruption cases involving Jacob Zuma's friends, the the Gupta family. Um, two of them were were at different times within a few weeks of each other hijacked and tortured. One of them died as a result. The other one returned to work, but I don't know if he's living in such a good state. And there was another whistleblower in a different story who, from the same province in South Africa who also died. So there have been reprisals. How has it been for you personally to be a part of knowing all about what is going on and writing about it and being a part of this change? How has being a part of this changed you? I'm, I'm always wary as a journalist to, to try and make, you know, speak about my, my, my own problems in the story um, because there's, there's so much more at stake and it's, it's my job to be a journalist and, and that job comes with, with, with certain risks and threats and, and, and I accept them when, when I become a journalist and I get paid a, a reasonably decent salary by, by general accounts to, to, to do that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm reluctant to make too much of a deal, deal of it. But, you know, since, uh, this, since you ask, and since this is an anthology for, for journalists, it is difficult. Um, you know, I, yeah, it's, it's psychologically difficult. Sometimes it's very, it's very easy to feel as if you're carrying the weight of a situation on your shoulders. You can see things going in a direction that are unjust, and you're sitting on on, on information that you've been investigating and gathering, and that information could could change the direction, could prevent an injustice, or at least mitigate against it, and and you start to, and, and it's very very easy to feel like like it's your your responsibility, but it it's it's actually not, and it's actually not, and 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 you you can't you can't you, know, you can't you can't stop the the direction of of a nation or, or or the world. You can only you can only do your job and do the best best you can to um, yeah to to write your stories or to tell tell the stories that you that you've been investigating. But yeah, it it leads to exhaustion, leads to depression, um, and yeah, it takes a lot of lot of self introspe introspection and and rest. <laughs> And experience and practice. You got to you, you got to become battle hardened. I think and I'm, I'm on, on my way there. Uh, also dealing with, with with my own skepticism and cynicism of the world. That that that's really grown. I remember when in my first sort of two, three, or even four years as an investigative journalist, lecturing students and being asked many times about, you know, doesn't doesn't it depress me? You know, how do I feel when when you write these stories and, and nothing ever seems to change. And 
you know, at the time I was, I was very cheerful and, and didn't, didn't think it affected me at all. But over the years, it, it, it accumulates. It, um, it does accumulate. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that, that, that's something that journalists doing this kind of work need, need, to, need to recognize is, the, is the, the, the trauma that they face. If they want to carry on doing this job, it's a, it's a long game. And you, 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 you're going to be much better if you, you you're going to have a much bigger, Im, better, bigger and better impact on the world if you can do it for a long time, because you can become a more authoritative voice and you can learn the, the ways of power and the ways of corruption and, and methods of accountability through, through time. But you're not going to get there if you burn out. So you need to go home and sleep.